Thank you so much for these um, very warm, uh, welcoming words. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, dear members of the Institute of International and European Affairs and uh, Madam Chair, dear Mrs. Cross, thank you very much uh, for your invitation uh, to speak uh, and for the welcome that you have given me here uh, today. It really is a pleasure for me to be here uh, in, in Dublin uh, to join you and, and talk about citizens' engagement. Uh, from the perspective of the new commission under our, our new, still very new president, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, also uh, the first uh, female president of our institution. And uh, even if it was not like that when we planned this event, I am I'm well aware that tomorrow uh, the people of this country uh, will exercise their, ri their rights uh, as citizens in their most eminent, uh, visible and direct way, of course, by going to the polls. Uh, to elect uh, a new government. And uh, I know that you've had the opportunity also uh, to hear from the leaders of your political parties in a series of pre-election events on Ireland and the EU after Brexit uh, as part of your future of the EU 27 uh, program. And of course, uh, you will not expect me, uh, and I will refrain from, uh, commenting on any specifics on the election uh, here in, in Ireland, but I would, of course, uh, emphasize uh, the crucial importance of engagement, of discussion and dialogue between citizens themselves, between citizens and politicians who seek their votes, uh, and between citizens and the institutions that serve them around elections and beyond. And this is very, very crucial. Uh, for the health and vitality of, of our democratic values and principles, not just at national level, but also, and increasingly so, uh, at European level. Uh, so a stronger connection uh, between people, policy, and decision-making is needed. And that's a, a general point that I want to make. Some speak about the need for a European demos, uh, if a truly European democracy uh, is to emerge, supplementing, not replacing, and I think it's a point that we need to stress time and again, national uh, democracy and uh, the identification and solidarity that that uh, subsumes. Citizens' engagement is decisive in this respect, uh, and also it does remain very essential even in the digital age with many challenges posed by online commentators, by influencers and manipulators sometimes, uh, new tools and methods of political mobilization, uh, risks of fragmentation, uh, but also many, many opportunities to engage with citizens in ways that address their needs uh, and concerns with accessibility, uh, increased indeed by the digital tools we have today, also the transparency and the visible follow-up that we can give and use uh, these tools for. Uh, but let me, uh, with this message, uh, my first message may be that engaging citizens uh, is more necessary than ever and that it strengthens our democracy. Just zoom out uh, a little bit for a second and take a look uh, at a very big picture uh, beyond the European Union just to identify some trends that are affecting, and I hope you can still you know, get an idea of what they say. Uh, you don't need uh, to, to dwell too much on the detail. But there are some, some quite challenging trends affecting uh, democracy all across the world, and not just here in, in Europe, not just here in our member states. And they are phenomena. Um, again, we will not have time to go into all of them. Uh, but that we need to recognize and be aware of uh, as we speak about strengthening our European uh, democracy. And this is work uh, uh, which is summarized uh, in this very, very simplified graphic presentation, by the way, from our uh, European uh, Political Strategy Center, uh, as it worked uh, in the previous mandate of the previous commission here issued in 2019, and which was the subject of a number of discussions. But as my point is simply as political uh, discourse uh, becomes more characterized by populism, 
by polarization of positions and active use of disinformation sometimes, it is all the more urgent uh, and necessary. And these are some of the trends that you can see there uh, on, the, on, the, on, the, on the graph. It's all the more urgent and necessary to discuss ways of ensuring active citizens' engagement as indeed uh, a way of both keeping our democracies vibrant, strengthening their resilience, and uh, renewing them at local, national, and also in our case, uh, at the European levels. Because as this, these different trends uh, indicate, democracy is across the world very much under pressure. Uh, for example, uh, only 4.5% uh, of the world population lives in what, again, uh, academic research uh, can qualify using different parameters as full <laughs> democracies. And almost one third uh, of the world's population lives in countries undergoing even democratic erosion, uh, or what, uh, again, these, uh, this research is calling autocratization. Um, again, I will not go deeper into this uh, research, but while electoral institutions and practices remain uh, robust or even uh, improving media freedom, uh, freedom of expression, and alternative sources of, uh, of information, uh, as well as, and you know that very well, of course, the rule of law uh, are under pressure in, in many places um, around the world. So just summing up some of the common traits of the populism, uh, organized confrontation and polarization around this line of division that uh, the perpetrators are trying to uh, establish between the people on one hand and the others, anti-pluralism, a belief that nothing should constrain the will of the true people, in, uh, in, uh, in quotation marks, and a tendency also to blur the lines uh, between facts, half facts, and fiction, um, increasingly exploiting the potential which is offered by social media. Uh, and of course, and it's, uh, Ireland is, is illustrating this uh, tomorrow, while voting remains by far the largest expression uh, of political participation, there are today uh, very visible changes in the ways uh, that citizens are engaging with politics. So we need to reflect we need to adapt. Uh, young people, as we have seen, are less inclined sometimes to vote regularly compared to their elders, uh, but they are most, more likely to post comments online, uh, of course, um, about social and political issues. And digital technologies are indeed creating a whole new type of social fabric uh, and a fertile ground for the spread of a wide variety of non-establishment stakeholders and networks. So all these developments and more, uh, they pose actually quite some significant challenges to what we're discussing today um, and to all of us who work in the public dom domain as policy makers and decision takers, but also uh, when it comes to uh, being uh, individual uh, citizens, of course, uh, and Democrats. And at European level, uh, an additional challenge is to create a real European public space, if not a demos, where participatory democracy uh, can flourish and a true, uh, let's say, real public space can take, t can take shape. And each of our member states, of course, uh, of the 27 uh, uh, composing the European Union today, they come with their own experience uh, and tradition of democratic processes. And it's not obvious that all Europeans absolutely want to debate uh, the same thing at the same time, uh, although sometimes they do <laughs> think of climate change, think recently of Brexit, think of even the coronavirus. Um, it is clear, however, that for the good health of our common European uh, democracy and our common institutions and common solutions to the challenges that we face together, we need to strengthen the foundations and re-engage with citizens on issues that matter to them. So uh, let's look at uh, a little bit what the basis is uh, 
for our uh, unique uh, system of, uh, of democracy for, to survive and flourish in the European Union. We have some basics uh, in our treaty. I'm definitely not going to read everything out uh, for you because that could become a little bit dry. Uh, but you see very clearly in our Article 2 uh, the foundations in terms of the values that we share and indeed which are very explicitly uh, the basis for our, uh, our being together, our uh, existence as a European Union and therefore also uh, for our democratic uh, foundations, uh, responsibility uh, of the Union and its institutions towards citizens and interaction with them uh, is part of this. Uh, so, uh, and we have it in Article 9 uh, also with the principle of equality of all the citizens who shall receive equal attention uh, from our institutions, uh, bodies and, and agencies. Uh, also there is a very, a very strong basis and uh, I, I go on to, to quote the Article 10, um, which also is uh, very, very is explicitly a basis for our European democracy because it states uh, that indeed the functioning of this union should be based on representative democracy uh, and that citizens are directly represented uh, at union level in the European Parliament and that each citizen uh, should have the right to participate in the democratic life uh, of the European Union. Um, and finally, uh, let me quote Article 11, because also there uh, we have uh, very directly uh, uh, an article that says citizens should be given uh, uh, by appropriate means uh, the opportunity to make known and publicly exchange their views in all areas of union action, uh, just to take that one. And the openness, the transparency is of course uh, eminently uh, anchored in this provision of the treaties. And finally, the broad consultations that need to be carried out uh, concerning uh, in, to ensure that the union's actions are coherent and transparent is also enshrined in this article. So again, um, we have uh, indeed a very, very strong basis uh, in the treaty taken together, all these articles. They underline the links between the values and the democratic basis of the Union, the need for the EU institutions to engage with the Union's citizens on a continuous basis, uh, and the importance of taking into account the views of our citizens in defining and implementing the policies and activities that the Union undertakes. So with past initiatives, with these articles, as well as with past uh, initiatives of citizens' engagement and participatory initiatives to come, we are not trying to replace the representative democracy uh, that already exists and is expressed through the European Parliament, but we are trying to actually support and reinforce uh, and complement this by making the EU uh, democratic uh, engagement with citizens more vibrant, more continuous, more interactive, and finally, more relevant. So let me mention a few of the, 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 the other things that we, uh, that we do uh, when it comes to ensuring that citizens actually uh, have a very, very central place, of course, in European democracy. European citizens' uh, uh, initiatives is something that we have uh, established first in 2011, and we recently updated it in a, in a new regulation that entered into force a few weeks ago. I just take these examples because I think it's important to situate our, uh, let's say, our more immediate focus on the Conference on the Future of Europe that I will uh, come to in a minute uh, as the latest initiative uh, on citizens' engagement in the wider <laughs> context, but we're getting there. Um, but this tool, just to mention it very briefly, uh, actually allows citizens and civil society to take the initiative uh, themselves and ask the Commission to propose legislation in areas where the Union uh, has competence to act. So again, apart from the treaty, we are not starting from scratch, but we are building on what has gone before. We are taking it, it further. This procedure, of course, 
uh, has a lot of requirements. Uh, you should be uh, resident in at least seven member states uh, to organize such an initiative. You should gather at least one million signatures from at least one quarter of the member states within one year of initial registration if you want to ask the Commission to act. And, uh, of course, there's no guarantee that your initiative will be successful. There's a whole range of, uh, of issues and, uh, and conditions that need to be met, but some have actually been uh, uh, successful. Uh, one which is ongoing, which is uh, an initiative to improve the protection of persons belonging to national and linguistic minorities and strengthen uh, the cultural and linguistic diversity in the Union. It's called Minority Safe Pack. Uh, it was registered in April 2017. There's another completed initiative, which is called Right to Water, uh, which was intended to ensure that all EU citizens enjoy the right to water and sanitation uh, and to exclude water supply and management of water resources uh, from internal market rules uh, and liberalization, just to mention that one. And then we have a fresh initiative which was registered in January 2020, Stop Finning, Stop the Trade. It's an initiative that calls on the EU to e amend existing legislation so as to introduce a ban on the trade of shark fins in the European Union. So we'll see uh, in the future uh, the fate uh, which will be reserved for this uh, initiative. Very brief mention of uh, a very important previous uh, debate on uh, the future of Europe that was launched uh, with the White Paper on the Future of Europe in uh, 2017, uh, in addition to, uh, to these uh, uh, initiatives. This was a necessary engagement initiative that was launched by former Commission President Juncker in the wake, of course, of the outcome of the Brexit referendum in the United Kingdom in June 2016. Um, and there was quite a, a wake-up call, of course, connected with uh, the Brexit referendum, uh, which was also uh, followed with the Bratislava Declaration, which was uh, adopted by the uh, EU 27 leaders in September 2016 where um, one of the things that was stressed there was the need for improved communication, and I quote, most importantly with our citizens, with emphasis on clarity, clarity sorry, honestly, honesty and a focus on uh, their expectations. And our response um, with the white paper was uh, to prepare a launch uh, of an extensive exercise in connection with this white paper, an open-ended means uh, of consulting and debating about how the EU should develop in the future on the basis of five scenarios. I'm sure you also debated them uh, a lot, uh, many of you sitting here. Uh, you will remember them. Should we carry on as usual? Should we have nothing for both but the single market? Should we have a scenario where those who want more EU do more EU together? Should we do less but more efficiently? Or should we do more together? And uh, a mixture of tools at the time was used uh, to engage citizens broadly, the other EU institutions, and of course the member states, and crucially, uh, civil societies uh, and citizens themselves. And we accompanied it with some reflection papers. There were five of them that within the space of a few months uh, in the spring, early summer 2017 set out, as we saw it at the time, the main challenges that were facing the European Union and which were nurturing uh, this debate uh, around the five scenarios that had been presented in a very open-ended manner by uh, former President Juncker. The reflection concerned the social dimension of the Union. It concerned the challenges of globalization. It concerned the deepening uh, of our economic and monetary union, uh, strengthening European defense and options for the future budget of the European Union, issues which I can safely say are still uh, very much uh, uh, at the heart of, uh, of the European uh, uh, policymaking today. 
And we also consulted uh, with an online exercise where citizens and stakeholders were invited uh, to submit their comments on the white paper and the reflection papers. And a specific citizens panel then, uh, and that was a novelty uh, for us. Uh, it was the first time we did this. We brought together 100 citizens uh, from all EU uh, 27 member states uh, to discuss the future of Europe, of course, in the context of this whole ongoing debate uh, at the time. They were selected uh, randomly uh, in order to represent the diversity of the European Union and its citizens, but of course very much inspired also by uh, initiatives uh, 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 that are also um, continuing to see the light uh, of day uh, across Europe. And the outcome was the drawing up not of solutions, answers, but actually the 12 questions, the 12 key questions that these selected citizens thought were the most important ones to ask um, the citizens of Europe in an online uh, survey that would support the white paper process. So it was a, it was a, a quite original uh, initiative for us in that this was not uh, done before in such a sequence uh, in, at the European Union level. And the European Parliament also conducted a series of high profile debates uh, in plenary with, uh, with uh, many member states leaders, of course, including uh, the Irish uh, Taoiseach uh, that was in, uh, in January 2018. And each leader was then able to, uh, in plenary, in the plenary of the European Parliament, set out their own thoughts, their own priorities and objectives for the future development of the Union uh, in the European Parliament as a platform for those, uh, for those um, uh, visions that leaders uh, were, were, were putting forward there. And admittedly, uh, we could probably have done uh, more at the time to set out the conclusions, all the different conclusions of this multifaceted process uh, in a more high profile, more systematic and less dispersed manner um, than, than we actually did. And, uh, and of course, uh, we could also uh, have made more clear that it was a continuous process and not, let's say, different, uh, uh, different elements of, uh, of, of the future of Europe exercise. But the process definitely had the advantage of raising um, the debate and also inspiring future priorities, which I had now, have now very much informed uh, the political cycle in which we find ourselves today. And we learned a lot of lessons from that exercise uh, as we now seek to deepen the engagement, uh, both deepen and widen the engagements with, uh, with our European citizens in the, in the von der Leyen Commission uh, that took uh, office uh, in December last year. For example, um, one of the key elements of the Juncker approach that I still dwell on a little bit longer, um, and one which one, the von der Leyen Commission indeed intends to, to build on under the current uh, mandate is uh, the organization of citizens' dialogues. We organized uh, around 1,850 dialogues with the participation of commissioners in the last uh, commission. Uh, and, and many times it brought uh, national political representatives together with uh, the European politicians. I think that was a key merit of uh, some of those dialogues, of course, uh, in, in engaging with citizens face to face uh, with people uh, whom they are, of course, there to serve because President Juncker, like Mrs. von der Leyen has done it now, uh, had asked all his commissioners to be uh, very active and engaging with dialogues, uh, in dialogues with citizens by presenting and communicating uh, the commission's common agenda, listening uh, to ideas and engaging with uh, stakeholders. And that, as I said, led to the organization of all these 1,850 dialogues uh, between 2015 and 2019 where we gathered some 218,000 uh, uh, participants in 650 locations uh, across the European Union. And for the informal meeting that took place uh, in, um, in uh, Sibiu in Romania last May, uh, in, uh, um, yes, the informal meeting, the Commission reported on the experience uh, to date uh, there in Sibiu. And overall, the participants in those dialogues tended to 
perceive, uh, and again, it has to do with the audiences that we uh, manage to engage with uh, in these exercises, but mostly perceive the European Union positively as uh, the most legitimate and indeed effective place to deal with global challenges. And when asked when, um, what European decisions would make them proud of belonging to the European Union, the respondents to the online consultation uh, spontaneously mentioned uh, issues relating to, and here we have it again, the environment and the climate, migration and refugees, uh, something that was the subject of great controversy in the past commission and still is, as you know, and also foreign affairs uh, and defense. So these were issues which were made it uh, really at the, at the very, very high end of, uh, of citizens' concerns. Uh, a more complete picture there in terms of uh, the issues uh, that uh, came up in the discussion uh, and in the online consultations which were conducted and the relative weight uh, that they all, um, uh, that citizens attached uh, to each one of them, just an idea. And these are, of course, uh, the, the, the issues which are at the very top of citizens' concerns, even if their importance vary. And of course, they are, they are, there's a big diversity uh, across Europe. Um, in, in terms of what how citizens uh, consider these different areas of, uh, of policy. So in summary, um, citizens definitely expect a lot from the European Union. Uh, they want a Europe that is competitive, fair and protective and that plays fully its role in the world. Those were again uh, things that came out of those consultations, very general things of course, and we will agree on that immediately. Uh, but also, uh, importantly, uh, they, they, they indicated that they see Europe as a continent of values where rule of law, the fight against corruption and non-discrimination must be upheld. Again, it came from all these consultations as results. Uh, and while trust uh, in the European institutions have uh, fortunately been increasing uh, again since 2014, Many participants indicated that they still consider our European Union as too remote uh, and expect it to be more efficient and more transparent. Uh, and some contributions called for action that would bring the European Union closer to citizens. Uh, so there we have it again. It included not only the desire for more cultural exchanges, which is something that citizens stress uh, regularly as something that they would like to see, learning other languages and teaching about the European Union at school. We're back to this need of knowledge about the European institutions and how they work, uh, but also using European symbols such as the flag and, and Europe Day. And some participants uh, expressed worry also about disinformation as a, a, a big risk for undermining the democratic uh, process. Um, it's a trend that we see very much confirmed, by the way, in our Eurobarometer surveys. And citizens would appreciate also more information about the Union to help them better understand and influence uh, decisions. So all these issues uh, were reflected uh, very much in our contribution to the strategic objectives uh, as we uh, designed them in the spring. Uh, when we contributed to, uh, to the Union's uh, next strategic agenda uh, back in May uh, last year. And they have, of course, also influenced very much uh, the priorities of uh, the new president, uh, the six priorities which uh, Ursula von der Leyen uh, put forward. And she was elected on that basis by the European Parliament, uh, namely the political guidelines where you've seen the Green Deal, the European Green Deal, an economy that works for people, a Europe fit for the digital age, promotion of our European way of life, a stronger Europe in the world, and a new push for our European democracy as, uh, as the, uh, uh, the central priorities uh, for this mandate of, of the new commission. Public opinion uh, is something that, as you know, we track uh, very regularly, and uh, it's our long-established tool, the Eurobarometer, for measuring public opinion uh, across the EU and, and really an essential support to the policy making at the EU level. So again, a dimension of, uh, uh, of the engagement uh, and indeed 
of the uh, of the close monitoring of public opinion as a basis uh, for our policy making. Um, I will not go into the the detail because I think we have we have too many things to discuss on on how we do it. But we always have in the standard Europe barometer uh, questions on trust uh, in political uh, institutions, democracy in the European Union, and European citizenships, and of course, what are the main concerns uh, of people uh, that uh, are being monitored in this. Um, uh, opinion survey. And the last uh, Eurobarometer that we published shows that overall trust uh, in the EU remains stable. Uh, trust in the EU is the majority view in 18 member states, and trust has increased in 12 member states since spring 2019. Uh, but we also see this increasing concern very strongly going up uh, about climate change and the environment. Uh, with support for EU measures to improve gender equality in the workplace and continued support for the economic and monetary union and the euro. Um, and some interesting results from, uh, from Ireland uh, indicate that 58% uh, uh, of, uh, of citizens trust in the EU, 63% have a positive image uh, of the EU, uh, and uh, and 53 54% sorry think that their voice counts and 73% are satisfied with how the european democracy works that is a record uh, not found anywhere else in the european union <laughs> so uh, also we should not be complacent about it still but it is encouraging uh, allow me to say that and for the, for, for the forthcoming uh, conference on the future of Europe, of course, the Eurobarometer will continue to be a very uh, important tool uh, that will accompany us um, in, uh, in the exercise that I will come to in just a few seconds. Um, just leaving with you there the, um, the European election results as we saw them, the final turnout, uh, which was indeed uh, encouraging, uh, even if... Uh, in Ireland, uh, we saw a little bit of, of the opposite phenomenon to the general trend, as we saw the turnout going down from 52.4 percent uh, in uh, 2014 to 49.7 percent in 2019, and uh, and there was a very low uh, youth, youth turnout uh, as well, according to the figures that we have uh, from the European Parliament. So that uh, I'd be interested to hear your, your explanation from that. But no complacency, even if the general result is encouraging, we definitely cannot be complacent about them and need to uh, continue to nurture uh, the participatory uh, democracy as we are on our way into uh, this new political cycle. And that's where the Conference on the Future of Europe uh, centrally uh, comes in, uh, where, of course, President von der Leyen has very clearly expressed this as a, a central commitment, a commitment to give Europeans a greater uh, say on uh, the policies uh, of the future of the European Union. And this comes back to, uh, right back to when she was actually nominated as candidate for president of the commission last summer. Um, she wanted to go beyond the existing tools uh, to a new level of citizens' engagement. And she elaborated these intentions in the political guidelines uh, in July last year and stressed uh, the need to strengthen this link and link the connection that's really central for what we're discussing between people, nations, and institutions, uh, between expectations and delivery, between words and deeds. And among the six priorities that I uh, already mentioned very briefly, she included one on a new push uh, for European democracy. And in this context, and also in light of uh, this increased turnout that we saw on the screen, uh, she proposed indeed to go further than ever before in giving Europeans a stronger say in decision making. So it's very much about listening, but it's also uh, influencing uh, the decision making. It's about uh, making a mark on the policies of the future of Europe. 
So States. President von der Leyen outlined her wish to establish this conference on the future of Europe uh, that should last two years, starting from from this summer and uh, two years ahead. So not a one-off event, but a continuous uh, process. And the conference should, in the President's view, bring together citizens, including a significant role for young people, civil society, and European institutions as equal partners. And we should, of course, and that's what we're busy doing now, uh, prepare the conference well with a clear scope clear objectives agreed between the European Parliament, the Council, and the Commission. And uh, uh, President von der Leyen was clear at the time she was president-elect. Uh, she, she indicated her readiness to follow up uh, on what is agreed, including by legislative action, if appropriate. And she would also be open, uh, if uh, justified, uh, to treaty change. This is what she indicated. But for more than anything, it was for her bringing Europe closer to home, making it less remote. We saw it was a concern for many citizens in the consultation. She responded to that in, in this way. And she followed it up, uh, this commitment from the guidelines in the individual mission letters of the uh, commissioners that she sent to each of the prospective members of her, of her team. And in each mission letter, there is actually a section that is called Bringing Europe Closer to Home. And there she reiterated that she wanted to strengthen this link between peoples in, people and the institutions that serve them and narrow the gap between what people expect and the reality and to communicate also more uh, about what Europe is doing. And she instructed her whole team, the vice president, but also every college member to engage with all Europeans, not just those who live in the capitals and are knowledgeable about the European Union, uh, but, but definitely she expects them to visit every member state within the first uh, half of the mandate at the latest. So that means by mid-2022, uh, coinciding with uh, uh, more or less the end of the, of the conference on the future of Europe. And she asked also, crucially, uh, commission members to com continue to meet very, very regularly with national parliaments and take part in citizens' dialogues across the Union, notably as part of the conference on the future of Europe. And, there, and she appointed uh, Vice President Schuitza uh, as uh, having special responsibility for this, um, and uh, uh, as, as, as vice president responsible for democracy and uh, demography. So again, uh, this is also an indication of the perceived link between the citizens' concern and the demographic challenges experienced by a number of regions across the Union, for example, in depopulation and the provision of public services, something that, of course, is very much at the heart of, of people's concerns. And going beyond uh, the earlier guidelines, she asked Vice President Schuitzer to work to improve participation in our democracy to ensure that people can indeed have the effective possibility to make their voice heard uh, and are listened to. And she underlined once again this need for a wide debate, clear objectives, and a tangible follow-up uh, to what is, uh, uh, what is uh, agreed. And she also noted the, um, the need for very close cooperation, of course, with the other institutions, the Council and the European Parliament, and make it easy uh, to participate both in person and also online, uh, and make it really an accessible exercise for our citizens. And the Vice President is busy uh, as we speak following up on these, uh, on these instructions uh, and of course already in her own hearing before the European Parliament in September and in other statements that she has made uh, since, she has underlined her commitment to producing results uh, in the conference that leads uh, to real action. Uh, and one of her priorities is to involve local and regional authorities, non-governmental organizations, and getting really deep into the regions uh, and talking to people on a continuous basis, uh, not just once every four and five years when an election uh, comes around, but actually um, as a part of this uh, very intense process that we have ahead of us uh, in the two years that the conference is going to run. 
uh, and dialogues, of course, we already have a number of them uh, happening with uh, individual commissioners. Undoubtedly, this will continue beyond the conference as well. So apart from Vice President Schuitzer, uh, the President also gave specific conference tasks uh, to two other Vice Presidents closely linked uh, to their own portfolio responsibilities, um, as well as chairing a new commissioners group on a new push for European democracy. Vice President Vera Jourova, who was already a member, as you will remember, uh, of the previous commission, was asked to play uh, a prominent role in the conference of the future of Europe. And she was asked notably to broker uh, the discussions between the European Parliament and the Council when it comes to improving the lead candidate system uh, and on the issue of transnational lists in European elections. And she will indeed uh, be representing the Commission in the conference on the future of Europe on these topics, modalities, governance, all of that still to be defined. I will come to some of the ideas that are around in a, while, in a moment. But first, I have to mention another Vice President, Maros Shevtovic, who was also a, a member of the previous college. Uh, this time, he was given uh, the responsibilities for interinstitutional relations and foresight. And in this capacity, he was asked to strengthen the evidence-based policymaking and identify long-term trends uh, on which the Commission needs to act and about which, uh, of course, the Commission needs to know more to uh, design the right uh, policy responses. And the President wants uh, this Vice President to play an active role in the Conference on the Future of Europe also, bringing the benefits of this work on foresight and foresight, uh, forward thinking uh, and planning uh, the major themes. So this is how uh, the Commission uh, based its work on the conference on the future of Europe. But uh, the other institutions have been very busy as well, uh, and, uh, um, and the European Parliament uh, more so, I would say, than any other institution. Um, and it was very important for President von der Leyen that this were to be a joint exercise with a leading role for the European Parliament, <laughs> but also one that shows joint responsibility for all the European institutions. Um, so, uh, the European Parliament is indeed taking this conference very seriously indeed. Uh, and I have myself met a, a number of, of uh, MEPs uh, recently in recent months, uh, including uh, Margaret McGuinness. Uh, and there has been a lot of, of internal debate uh, in the European Parliament also in and between political groups, in the committees, and in the plenary itself. And uh, essentially, uh, the European Parliament has prepared, I'm just summing it up, I'm probably not doing full justice uh, to what has been some very, very uh, uh, deep and comprehensive work. But uh, to sum it up, uh, there's a twin track here, one through the Constitutional Affairs Committee uh, of the European Parliament, and one through a specific working group that was established by the President, uh, President Sassoli of the European Parliament that brings together each uh, of the political groups. And the outcome uh, is the resolution that the European Parliament adopted on the 15th of January. And uh, it is a resolution that is very ambitious uh, in its scope, uh, in, in terms of also its governance, in terms of how it uh, envisages uh, the organization of the conference. And again, I'm, this is my reading of it, but uh, the European Parliament position places the emphasis on citizens at the, at the core of broad discussions on how to tackle both the internal and the external challenges uh, that are facing the Union today, calling again, like the Commission, for a very uh, inclusive uh, um, process uh, with people of all backgrounds, civil society, stakeholders of European, national, regional, and local level to be involved in actually setting the EU's priorities in line with citizens' concerns in a bottom-up, transparent, inclusive, and indeed very participatory approach. Um, there are details there. I'm sure you have studied them, and I would not uh, propose to go into to all the details of it, but simply mentioned that uh, one of the, 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 the key uh, things that the Parliament is proposing is to establish what they call citizens' agoras, 
with citizens' representatives um, chosen randomly in line with proportionality and representativeness criteria. It's a quite sophisticated <laughs> uh, uh, approach, uh, with youth agoras also being uh, set up, each comprising two to three hundred citizens uh, with a minimum of three uh, per member state, just to give you an example of the level of, of detail and granularity that the Parliament's proposals uh, involve, uh, and, and all the, the, the representation of uh, the different institutions uh, and bodies and social partners are also addressed in, in the Parliament's uh, position. Uh, where uh, at the heart of the uh, of the setup there is also a plenary uh, with 135 members from the European Parliament, 27 members from the Council, two to four members for each national parliament, three commissioners, four members each for the Economic and Social Committee and the Committee of the Regions, and two members. Uh, from the EU level social partners, just to give you an idea of the comprehensiveness of the approach. I will not go further into the detail of the governance envisaged, but it's very complete and it's very ambitious uh, in that respect. Now, uh, I come back to how we at the Commission uh, uh, put down uh, the, 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 the concept as we saw it on the 22nd of uh, January 2020, so very closely following the, uh, the Parliament's resolution, um, a paper that was designed as a contribution, a contribution to shape uh, the conference, putting more flesh on the bones that were already set out on our part, in the guidelines and in the, the mission letters. And we, uh, having this very valuable and substantive experience with citizens' dialogues, we, of course, uh, would want to build on the past experience um, while introducing a range of new elements uh, to increase, notably, the outreach, you know, get deeper and wider, engage with new audiences, uh, and strengthen ways for people to actually take part in shaping the future uh, EU action. Um, so we proposed two distinct uh, work strands, one that was focused on political priorities, so uh, what matters to, to citizens in, in our view, uh, and which was also set out in the President's uh, guidelines and the Council's uh, strategic agenda. And, and of course, without uh, limiting in any way the issues that could be discussed, but nevertheless seeing uh, the political priorities, the strategic agenda as a useful frame for the exercise because it is already inspired uh, by uh, indeed citizens' uh, <laughs> concerns and what the citizens have, has told us in, have told us in the previous exercises. Um, the other strand, uh, in addition to this very policy-focused strand, addresses topics which are specifically related to the democratic processes and institutional matters, notably the lead candidate system and transnational lists uh, for elections uh, to the European Parliament. And for us, this is a bottom-up exercise, so we are insisting uh, more on on, on, the, on the engagement uh, with citizens and on the policy focus on the fact that we need to make this exercise really accessible to people well beyond the capitals. Again, uh, I insist from all corners of the European Union, uh, other EU institutions, national parliaments, social partners, regional and local authorities, civil society should of course uh, be invited to join there. I think we have very common ground uh, between all institutions in this respect. And then uh, we also mentioned that we should uh, have a multilingual online platform that should ensure that this is a transparent exercise, uh, that it's one that supports wider uh, participation, including crucially this outreach to younger people, which is so essential for uh, uh, making our, our democracy uh, uh, vibrant and sustainable. Uh, and here we are also committing to take the most effective actions with other institutions to integrate uh, the citizens' ideas uh, back into policy making, 
The whole feedback process will be central in this respect. Citizens have to know what happens to what uh, they are telling us, something that was not so obvious in previous exercises, even if we made quite a lot of efforts uh, also <coughs> online and in our different reports. But uh, the communication approach uh, needs surely to be uh, more ambitious this time. Um, very crucial that we take joint responsibility for this um, in terms of when defining the concept, the structure, the scope, and the timing of all of this. This is where we are. We are in this process where um, uh, soon we will see, um, and I'll come to that in a moment, uh, the institutions all having made their positions clear. Then, of course, we will have to find common ground uh, so that the exercise can indeed uh, take uh, its final uh, design, uh, um, something, of course, which uh, in the end it will only do when citizens engage uh, in it in, uh, in diverse and, and I'm sure multifaceted ways, but, uh, but this is where we are at the moment. And let me just mention, uh, as, as DG Communication, we, uh, in, in, in my department, will of course put our resources uh, at the disposal of the whole exercise notably when it comes to uh, the representations in the, in the member states, who are, of course, a vital link uh, that we have uh, in every member state of the European Union to organizations and citizens on the ground, and uh, through them also these 500 uh, uh, Europe Direct cit uh, Information Centers, which uh, work very closely together with the representations, key channels uh, when it comes to reaching out uh, way beyond uh, the capitals of our member states on EU policies and instruments. So um, we have reiterated, and there again, I think all institutions see things the same way. We should launch the process on the 9th of May this year, which is incidentally also the 17th anniversary of uh, uh, the Schuman Declaration. And uh, uh, Vice President uh, Schuitzer has, uh, with the president, uh, suggested a launch event in Dubrovnik, since Croatia is indeed holding uh, the presidency of the council for the first time during the launch uh, uh, time. So that would be uh, a natural thing to do. Now, um, I haven't mentioned in detail the, uh, the European Council and the Council, but of course work has been going on there as well. Um, it started uh, with, uh, with a Franco-German paper, and then it took shape uh, uh, particularly uh, under the, um, the Croatian uh, presidency, uh, which is ongoing, but even before there were European Council conclusions already in December. Uh, about this that outlined, uh, let's say, the basis for the work which is now ongoing between the member states to, uh, to agree on a mandate uh, for uh, this conference um, that will then be the basis for negotiating with the two other institutions on the final design. Um, indeed, the European Council asked in December the Croatian presidency uh, to work uh, to define such a mandate. Uh, and on that basis engage with the European Commission and the Parliament. Uh, and it la in last week's meeting in the General Affairs Council, the discussion on the basis of a presidency non-paper underlined uh, very much the uh, importance of putting citizens at the heart of the conference and ensuring that it actually contributes to the development of, uh, of EU policies and involves a wide range of stakeholders and groups. Um, there are differences of views uh, between the institutions uh, when it comes to governance and representation in the uh, conferences bodies. These are some of the things that we have to agree on. And of course, um, balanced representation uh, of the three EU institutions are something that, uh, uh, are something that will surely play a, a role in this uh, discussion. Uh, and the same goes for the involvement of the national parliaments, in addition to, of course, uh, the place uh, which is important of other European institutions, of stakeholders, of civil society, and uh, more than anything, of citizens themselves. Um, so uh, we will see how exactly the discussion uh, will continue and how uh, quickly we can uh, agree uh, on a joint uh, declaration, because that's uh, the idea that we have, at least to have a broad frame uh, for the scope and the principles and the concept uh, to be agreed between the institutions. 
uh, what it could look like uh, in a very basic fashion. Uh, and again, I, I stress this is just what it could look like, uh, would be something uh, that took uh, the, the European Parliament resolution, our contribution, and the state of play uh, of the discussions uh, in the Council as a basis. Um, here are some of the elements uh, that could perhaps find themselves in the final outcome, um, bearing in mind that this outcome doesn't exist yet. Um, and there are a number of possibilities um, before we actually can see uh, the full shape of, uh, of this um, architecture. But we don't have much time to take it forward if we wish to have it ready and launched and uh, indeed inviting citizens to, to join as from the 9th of, uh, of May this year. So we are already working on this uh, uh, draft joint declaration uh, that we would hope to put on the table uh, as a suggestion, um, capturing, let's say, what could be a common position uh, in, in due course. But this will be a negotiation, uh, no, no doubt about this. Um, and bear in mind that we would also need very shortly uh, to make progress also on some sort of charter that will go down in more detail uh, into what conditions, what uh, uh, terms uh, the um, events and uh, event organizers would need to respect uh, if uh, they were to be considered as events, debates, uh, falling under the umbrella of the conference, because the idea is, of course, that this needs to be uh, something where citizens can, in this bottom-up exercise that we have in mind at least, um, and that I think we all have in mind be, be among institutions, um, enable uh, citizens to bring messages back to the policymakers. Um, so a conceptualization where you have basically a national level and a very multifaceted uh, uh, field of opportunities for organizing debates, and then a European level, um, the European Parliament, I mentioned, call them agoras. Uh, question is, should they be transnational? Uh, should they be um, uh, randomly selected? All these things uh, have to be uh, defined. Crucially, um, there need to be space for both physical and online debates. There needs to be feedback. And there needs to be uh, uh, reporting and recommendations, and there needs to be translation into uh, results um, when it is warranted by the European institutions. I think that these things are elements that will find themselves one way or the other into the final architecture of this uh, conference and also into the ensuing uh, uh, term sheet or charter or protocol or what we will call it that will enable uh, the organization of debates to take shape um, and of course resources financing will inevitably also enter the equation uh, in due course. What's new here um, in this compared to what we've done already in the past? Uh, I think the joint responsibility that I have stressed a lot in this uh, presentation is, is something that is, uh, is very clearly a, a new element uh, that would then give, have its ex expression in a joint declaration, uh, also a charter at European level for events and uh, organizers uh, of, for all uh, those who will be busy uh, organizing debates uh, in, uh, in the member states uh, will be a new thing. The feedback mechanism uh, where we manage to channel that wealth, hopefully, of uh, inputs and uh, results from the different uh, debates on the ground will also be something that is quite a challenge to design. How do we translate it? You can imagine there is also a linguistic dimension to this. Uh, going beyond the usual suspects uh, and uh, away from any sort of, of uh, preaching to the usual suspects and reaching much more the young people who sometimes have not engaged so much uh, about uh, European affairs. And then, of course, getting into the all corners of Europe, into the regions uh, with uh, also the help and support of this online multilingual platform. Uh, those are some of the the novelty elements that we see, uh, but it's incremental uh, because we are building on, on, on a basis. And we are, of course, also drawing on, crucially, 
the many very interesting experiences uh, across Europe uh, uh, at a smaller scale and often uh, debating and deciding on uh, precise issues uh, to see how we can, uh, we can design this. Um, I think that that is uh, what we need to say about this, and I'm approaching the end of my long presentation, too long presentation, but there's a lot to, to say on this. I hope we will still have time to, uh, to engage. Uh, next steps, as I was saying, um, are immediately defining the position of, uh, of the Council and then to have these discussions between the institutions uh, and agree on a common position, hopefully. Uh, and then um, it, 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 it actually follows quite logically that, of course, then the terms will need to be clear, the participation will have to be clear, and, of course, in that, modalities for involving the national parliaments is something that is extremely important for the national parliaments, but also for us uh, to define very clearly before we then can move into the practicalities that include uh, the points that I have summed up very quickly in the uh, in the column in the right that can then hopefully lead to uh, to launching events uh, across Europe, also to give it a high visibility as a, as a starting point, um, because as we all know, uh, getting attention, media attention in particular for this kind of event is not always obvious, uh, but with a scale and a link. Uh, to the 9th of May 2020, that would be a very emblematic and symbolic good moment to, to, to launch this, um, this uh, big new uh, initiative. And we need, uh, and I would stress that at the end, um, and it links a little bit to the model I presented before, even if we didn't write it, it's very important for us that there's also a strong deliberative element uh, for citizens in this uh, in this exercise uh, when it comes to the European level, where we need to also enable citizens to engage with citizens, uh, but also uh, enable them to mobilize and draw on expertise uh, to feed the discussions, draw in people who can also help organize and animate events and who can provide stimulating and purposeful <laughs> uh, material research and give new angles to the problems that we're discussing or that citizens will be discussing at the different uh, events. So um, if I just uh, sum up very, very quickly the main messages uh, that I've tried to pass here, um, engaging more with citizens uh, is necessary to strengthen and renew our European democracy. And it's definitely all the more essential uh, in these days uh, in the context of populism fragmentation and also, uh, and in, in, in some member states more than others perhaps, um, but we're all concerned about it, uh, the disinformation. And secondly, um, at the European level, we do have tools in place uh, for engagement and consultations of citizens that we should develop. We need to go further and we must start a more inclusive uh, conversation uh, with Europe's citizens about the future of Europe and also provide much better feedback than we have done in the past uh, on how results of dialogues and debates are used. And finally, uh, by proposing uh, the conference on the future of Europe, Ursula von der Leyen is committed to give Europeans uh, a greater say, but it's not just uh, for, for the Commission to do that, of course. It has to be a genuinely joint effort uh, and to be meaningful it definitely requires uh, the support and participation not only uh, by the EU institutions but also by member states and by, uh, by civil society. And in, so in doing this, of course, reaching out to our young people, young people are the future, uh, and uh, our democratic future. So nothing could be more uh, important uh, than that. And let me finish with a few words on, on Ireland because I think we can really benefit uh, from your considerable and very valuable experience in this domain. Uh, we've already been in touch with, uh, with yourselves, of course, and uh, a number of people in Ireland who have helped us uh, moving our thinking, um, but we can always uh, do with more, so therefore I'm looking forward to, uh, to hear what you think. Um, and your advice will certainly help a lot. Um, 
not only from the previous citizens' consultations, but also from all the specific uh, citizens' assembly exercises that you have had in recent years. Uh, and there's one that is currently uh, ongoing, if I'm not mistaken, on the subject of gender equality also. So making this a meaningful exercise and not a repetition um, of what we've already done, I think we need uh, experiences such as uh, the Irish ones uh, to, to, to move it further because making uh, citizens feel that they can really make a difference and have an impact uh, is, is in, in the end what we, what we really want to do. So thank you very much for listening to me for so long and, uh, and uh, I hope to, um, to have at least uh, 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 given a little bit fruit for thought on, and given you some information also on where we stand uh, in developing the uh, conference on the future of Europe, which depends on, on all of us to become a success. Thank you. Yes, do please sit down. Thank you very much indeed, um, <laughs> Director General, for that very comprehensive overview of uh, where things are, where we're coming from, and I think a very good direction as to where we're going to. Um, I think we can uh, have uh, some minutes for questions, and uh, if I could just reiterate, uh, if you could, uh, when you put in a question, if you could identify your organization, uh, name an organization. Sorry, we have here, Kevin, and Mike. Um, My name is Nevin Keary. I'm speaking initially as a member of the Institute. Uh, Sorry, uh, I very much welcome, which I read as an invitation, and that you've already contact with the Institute about making some contribution. And I hope the Institute will take a decision to involve all its members in uh, thinking uh, about this very important project. But secondly, from my experience, I worked in the European Commission on communication and in uh, what would now be your DG, mm -hmm. and I'm quite shocked by the scope of everything that you've told us mm -hmm. and feel that it will need massive resources yes. and a very large staff, uh, even just to monitor uh, any of us who are trying to read uh, what is happening in research institutes in other member states and so on. It's an enormous job to keep up to date with what people are contributing and then the schema you've set out. So is there a real prospect that you will get the staff and resources and backup to make a go of this? Yes, if that's all right, Michael, and we have two more on the side. Terry will do it. Hello, uh, Michael Doyle, member of the Institute and former EU official. Um, I mean, if we think back to the report or the process adopted by Felipe Gonzalez and the Reflection Group on the Future of Europe 10 years ago, uh, I think it's to be commended how the new process is being designed to be much more inclusive and participatory. Uh, and I think we could be fairly confident that at the end of that, we'll come up with uh, policy priorities and other recommendations that will have a broad consensus. But I think there's another aspect to involving uh, Europeans, and that's to have a larger scale awareness and mobilization of people. And perhaps there is inspiration that can be somehow taken from how Greta Thunberg and others have engaged youth, and not so young as well, on a very large scale. Because if we look at even at Eurobarometer indications, they're quite positive, but I often wonder how informed the people who are giving these assessments really are. And that's a big challenge. We all know those of us who have worked in the institutions as well. So I just wonder, are there ideas, are there people working on how to have a more a really large-scale uh, engagement and commitment of people so that at the end of it, we will have ownership and so on of the uh, priorities and recommendations. Thank you. If you'd like to take two, we have several sure. more questions okay. as well, so um, I'll leave um, those two with you. Yeah, very good. No, thank you very much for these uh, very important aspects that both uh, former colleagues are, are, are underlining. Um, I think it's, it's, it's spot on. Um, it's, it's a huge uh, and unprecedented exercise that we are, we are lining up here, one that can only be done, and I insisted very much on that, if we uh, pool our resources between institutions, but 
the institutions will not do this alone. Now we need partners, we need strong partners on the ground, both uh, driven and indeed uh, owned by the member states themselves. This is also why it's so important what the discussions which are ongoing in the council at the moment, you know, how will member states actually take ownership of this exercise? Mm -hmm. Uh, in the same way that um, we have seen the European Parliament and, and the Commission have done, you know, what will they, what agreement would they reach on their level of engagement in this exercise? And again, this will still not be enough. Uh, we will need the other European institutions, uh, the Committee of the Regions, the Economic and Social Committee, but also partners on the ground. We will need to use our networks. We have our own networks uh, in the European Commission. We have our representation. Uh, Jerry Kiley is heading it here in Ireland. We have our Europe Direct Information Centers, which are also already very good at organizing and engaging uh, debates with uh, citizens on the ground. We have 500 of those across Europe in the member states. And of course, we have help uh, from also the digital age, as it were, even if, of course, it will take a lot of good organization, of good design, intelligent platforms, and also uh, resources, indeed, to make sure that the transparency of this exercise is, uh, is something that is a strong uh, uh, component. Uh, and that means, for example, operating in all the European Union la languages. So um, it is a tall order, and we will also have to make choices, because we will not be able to to do everything in this exercise. Huh? So we will have to define a scope which is realistic, and then we will have to also hand it out as a concept to civil society you know, to buy in and take part. Huh? And then we will see also how we can support this. Huh? This is a discussion at political level that will need to be also uh, part of the equation. Uh, what is the funding that uh, we could make available um, for this, not only for my staff, I would like to have my more staff. I don't think I'm going to get much more staff. This is not, uh, let's say, where the focus is at the moment. This is not where the prioritization is. Um, we are having very tough budget negotiations between member states at the moment. I think we will very much have to leverage uh, partnerships uh, all across Europe uh, to make this exercise a success. But no doubt about it, uh, new things will have to be done. For example, when it comes to uh, setting up a digital platform, but even there, we're trying to use also very good tools that we have, but that we have not used for this purpose uh, uh, before. Um, <coughs> let me just remind myself of the Greta other Thunberg. angle. <laughs> yeah, Greta Thunberg, how can we use uh, inspiration uh, mm -hmm. from uh, what mm -hmm. she has done so uh, emblematically and fantastically when she has mobilized our youth around uh, one of the, well, what they certainly consider as the most uh, defining and urgent uh, issue for their, for their generation. Yes, we can take inspiration from that, but we can also tap into that, I think. I think we should tap into, we should go with this conference on the future of Europe, not to the conference in Brussels, but we should go where people are, you know, and where young people uh, do things together, uh, and where people uh, discuss and debate uh, political issues. So we will have to, to tap into existing discussions. We will have to find fora that are already active and help uh, uh, you know, them maybe engage on issues uh, that they think are important for their future and for Europe's future. So I think it's very much about tapping into, uh, indeed, dynamics and uh, organizations like this. It's not easy because much of this, for example, uh, you know, climate for future is not very... Uh, is not very organized uh, necessarily. So uh, we have a challenge there. But again, we are well plugged in uh, around Europe on the ground uh, to, to identify uh, partners. Uh, so this is one of the first things that I think we should do. Thank you. Now we have two questions over there. Yes. <coughs> um, my name is Jerry Wardell. I'm the director of uh, Code Images, Dublin's energy agency, local energy agency. And uh, for, I'd like to thank you very much for your wonderful presentation, but even more for taking the trouble to come here today and actually doing what you're talking about, um, coming uh, face to face, coming out of from your office and coming here. Um, uh, uh, the Kodima, my agency was set up in the 1990s, mm -hmm. which is a little bit reminiscent to what you've been talking about now, where there was, um, it was set up, set up as a European program to establish local and regional energy agencies mm -hmm. and you've talked quite a bit today about that type of thing mm -hmm. and the idea w was to um, 
the, you know, the word agency is, is to do with the influence, the flow of events and empowerment of the local and regional actors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, the, you know, it, there were about seven, 400 of these agencies set up across Europe, mm -hmm. and um, they, mm -hmm. they thrive for a while. But in a way, the, the, the pendulum, you know, the, the balance between structure mm -hmm. you know, the, and, and the agency, mm -hmm. um, the pendulum swings back and forth quite a bit. And uh, during the 2000s, I think, they you know, swung away from this concept. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of these agencies didn't survive that period. Mm -hmm. uh, we did establish a sort of network to, to help each other. Mm -hmm. And there was a reflection group, uh, a managed energy reflection group at DG Energy, which mm -hmm. was really valuable, mm -hmm. uh, represented by uh, these networks. Mm -hmm. and it, it, but it, it survived only for a few years. Mm -hmm. And as the pendulum swung away from this concept during the the, the noughties, mm -hmm. um, the, a lot of these agencies fell by the way, these structures. Mm -hmm. The managed energy um, uh, program for regional and local energy agencies was, was uh, discontinued when Horizon 2020 mm -hmm. came in, mm -hmm. which isn't so well suited to local and regional mm -hmm. <coughs> actors. Mm -hmm. um, so so uh, the question is then, what is the possibility of using your influence to try and um, establish programs which will support directly local and regional actors uh, in, in this time. The pendulum seems to be swinging back again in favor of mm -hmm. you know, the bottom-up approach, mm -hmm. as you talk about. Mm -hmm. But uh, uh, what's the possibility of, of some new programs being introduced in the new commission to mm -hmm. target directly local and regional actors? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Derek. We have one other question. I'm afraid due to time constraints, uh, we have to make this the last one. Uh, John Kennedy, member of the Institute, also a Finale Councillor. Just with regards to the Citizens Initiative, um, you know, is it, is it considered the 71 registrations? Is that a satisfactory level? Um, I just wonder, you know, is the 1 million signatures threshold, is that too high, maybe? It's certainly for a member state, such as Ireland, a small member state, that's a very significant amount of the population. And although it's transnational, obviously with such initiatives, there's a critical mass that has to be achieved, much easier to achieve uh, in France or Germany, for example. And this was a key uh, setting point, as I recall, for the Lisbon Treaty referendum, you know, it was certainly in this, in this country it was emphasized by, by parties as a, as a championing point. So I'm just wondering, perhaps that should be under significant review at this stage. Thank you. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. Um, I would see all this, uh, including the last one on the, on the number of signatures as things which can be debated. You know, it's, it's debatable. Huh? Uh, and and uh, the, 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 the support uh, to different kinds of networks, of course, there are many networks being supported in different programs in the European Union today. Much support is also foreseen in the future uh, multi-annual financial framework uh, again. I mean, we are, for example, at the moment, but it's only from a communications point of view, I have to add, inventorying a little bit, you know, our different networks across the European Union precisely to assess, you know, what is the engagement potential, because that's, of course, my interest right now in this exercise to look at, of all the different networks that we have and support, you know, who all have purposes, you know, be it uh, different kinds of regional, social funding, business, uh, small, medium-sized enterprises, you know, you name it, energy, why not? Uh, I mean, again, I'm not very knowledgeable about the, uh, uh, the networks in, in the energy area, but... But all these things, I think, is, is something that we need, to, we need to discuss. You know, I cannot sit here and evaluate uh, the chances of uh, new programs in the future uh, reviving the networks that you're talking about. But these are debates uh, that, that, that deserve to, be, uh, to exist, uh, as indeed are the thresholds for what is the right level of uh, citizen signatures for a, a new citizen initiative. I mentioned uh, to you the updating that we have just done. Uh, of the uh, of the rules after s very carefully assessing and consulting on uh, precisely this uh, so i'm not sure that tomorrow you know there will be a proposal to change this but again i'm not sitting here to prejudge uh, uh, that what is 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 worth discussing in precisely this upcoming conference on the future of europe i mean if this is a valid issue and uh, and something that uh, uh, a lot of citizens uh, feel the same way about, then there are no taboos in this discussion. So this would be my answer. Yeah. No taboos, uh, and let's have a really vibrant debate, and thank you for everything you're doing to contribute to it. Uh, 
and I hope you will do so uh, throughout this exercise and beyond. Thank you very much for inviting me. Thank you very much indeed for coming and giving us such an overall comprehensive view. There's clearly a lot of work for all of us to do. And just to say, we have our work with the Department of Foreign Affairs in the future of the EU27 group, which is ongoing, and the outreach aspects of that we are going to work hard on in the coming years. So thank you so much thank again, much. Pia, for coming. Thank you. And we wish you well in drawing up uh, and uh, the uh, working towards the conference. Thank you. Thank you.